So it's just me and Frank today, which means it's either someone is going to lose their voice screaming at the top of their lungs, or we're going to stretch this all the way to five hours because of a Michael Conforto debate. But either way, we do have a lot to cover this week for the Blue and Orange. Episode 16 of the Mets Weekly Podcast, 60 Minutes of Brutal Honesty, begins now. So y'all know the drill, even though it's been said every single time, subscribe to the Mets Weekly channel for content throughout the week, including videos, live streams, shorts, and this very podcast every single Monday. Follow us on TikTok, Twitter, all those individual links are in the description. So we are still on the tail end of a West Coast road trip that I feel like has gone on for way too long. The Mets are currently, as we're recording this, they could jump into first place because the Braves just lost. The Mets have been somewhat rolling, but it's it's still been as stressful as it can be. You know, the wins count as wins, the losses count as losses, but it's only April. It's very early. Yeah, I mean, it's just another week like we've been talking about injuries, inconsistencies, but those are all things that happen with the Mets. Like you said, this West Coast tr uh, trip has gone a long time, but I kind of like they talked about one of the broadcasts, I forget what day it was, but they said that since the Mets are doing so much of the West Coast trip now, and that since this year you play every division, that they won't have as many West Coast trips. Now they're getting so much of it done at once, they won't be changing time zones a lot. So I think all in all, it's balancing out pretty well. This is the best I've seen them perform on a West Coast trip. Whether we've whether we've had you know good pitching performances or good hitting performances, whatever. But I mean, the result is there. They are winning a majority of these games, and usually we would be staying up at ten o'clock at night watching the Mets and just seeing them lose in just heartbreaking fashion to the Dodgers or the Giants or the Padres. So this is definitely a different breath of fresh air, but, you know, we'll obviously get into the nitty gritty as of right now. Yeah, there's only one more West Coast, like, late, late trip. They face the Padres and the Diamondbacks. Other than that, it's like, you know, you go to Houston, you go to Colorado, and those games aren't as, as, as intense. You don't have that actual Pacific time difference. So there's just one more time that they have to do it. So that, that's pretty good, all things considered, because they have the Angels at home. So they avoid that trip. It is going to be a different look because you're going to be playing all 29 other teams this year. So, I I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's definitely a lot of different matchups, a lot of different teams that you don't regularly see them unless they're playing in the World Series or every three years. So Aces versus Aces, like Max Scherzer versus Otani or your, exactly. you know, your Verlander versus Otani. One of the very few rule changes I actually like a lot because I just got so tired of constantly seeing the Marlins and the Nationals and the Phillies and Braves. It felt like you're watching almost the same thing over and over. I just think from a consumer standpoint, from an entertainment standpoint, it's nice to see these other players, these other different teams, different ballparks and you just get a better feel for the game and that's coming from a really old school person who likes all the old school rules all the old things but um from this rule i do like it so now let's just get to the mets as a whole and let's start with the top flame of the fire wednesday afternoon at dodger stadium the mets ace max scherzer was ejected by umpire phil cuzzy after finding his hands very sticky due to a unknown substance scherzer's glove was originally checked before the bottom of the third inning where he was asked to wash his hands but cuzzy explained that Max's hands were the stickiest he has ever seen. After the game, Scherzer has said the following, I swear on my kid's life, I'm not using anything else. This is sweat and rosin, sweat and rosin. I'd have to be an absolute idiot to use anything else. I literally go out there with sweat and rosin, I get ejected. Scherzer has now been suspended for 10 games, and it was announced that he will not appeal with a non-neutral arbitrator to be present. Max will be eligible to return on May 1st against the Braves as the Mets will play with a 25-man roster until then. Yeah, I mean, th this was just really bizarre. I mean, out of nowhere. And it it's one of those things where you can kind of say only the Mets. I mean, how often, if ever, do we see 10-game suspensions for guys having sticky hands and sticky gloves and things like that? It feels like we haven't seen it ever since these new rules have come into place with the whole sticky substance. And what I find so interesting is that Max Scherzer says, oh, I swear on my kids, sweat rosin, but he won't appeal. Like, that doesn't necessarily match as far as, like, your thought process. And especially, I think if it's one of those things, I'm not sure if there's, like, normal suspensions, where if he appeals, the Mets still kind of have him on the roster kind of thing. So it's just very weird uh, the way that he's gone about it, and they're going to have to play shorthanded. But 
what this did remind me of is it was right when I think the new rules were instituted and Max Scherzer were going up against the Phillies and Joe Girardi had that big outburst saying that Max Scherzer mm-hmm. has something on the back of his hair and Scherzer, you know, against that big argument and everything, but they ended up not finding anything there. So I just think that for the, um, the for the umpire to say this is the most I've ever seen and for suspension to happen, I would have to say there has to be something going on. You know, I mean, Max Scherzer could say he was sweating and everything like that, but it's April. I mean, we're not in uh, Arizona in July. You know what I mean? Like, th- this wasn't the hottest day ever. You know, maybe Max uses some rosin and things like that. So I just find it very suspicious, uh, in my opinion, honestly, because here's a guy who is getting paid over $40 million. We know we've talked about it constantly. But you expect better from your veteran. You expect better out of your Hall of Fame. You're a guy over 40 years old that he wouldn't – I'm not saying that Max Scherzer definitely cheated, but just the fact that he was even highly suspicious of, you know – Almost again, cheating is not really the right word, but trying to get a competitive advantage, it kind of surprises me. I'm pretty much torn in the middle of this because I I don't think Max Scherzer did cheat. I think there was just more of a had a substance that was legal, but it just wasn't in wrong place at the wrong time. I think that was probably just the whole situation. If you look at things that, you know, some of these substances would enhance, they didn't. Same spin rates, guy was at the same velocity, nothing. There was no, It didn't even enhance it whatsoever. Yeah. Now, on the other side, this is kind of one of the stressful points where we're dealing with all of this type of stuff, especially to the starting rotation. We'll get to that in a second. But there isn't really much of a reliable point. And that's something that we're looking at. There's not really much dependability whatsoever. A state of dependability with Max Scherzer, I don't think that he has really shown that as a Met so far. And I'm not going to lie... I mean, you know, a few injuries here and then he gets hurt, he's older, whatever. We saw what happened in the playoffs. He did not show up. He was not good. And now we're having this whole situation. So I don't think that he can be put under that piece of dependability yet. When they put on the Mets uniform, it's a completely different story of how you are actually viewed as a pitcher. Anything that you did past your career, it doesn't matter unless you translate it to New York. We've seen glimpses of it. We haven't really seen the Max Scherzer. There's been a little bit more of pieces of obstacles to overcome, this being one of them. I think that more of him not appealing was obviously because it looks like the arbitrator or the neutral party that was going to be in this case, it looked like it was going to be more um, in favor for the MLB. That's what he pretty much like said it was going to be. Then what's the point of neutral? No clue. <laughs> It just, it seems like someone it's representing more of the MLB and just kind of like someone who is, you know, neutral with the MLBPA, something like that. But also... Isn't Scherzer the leader of the MLBPA? That's what I mean. Like, I don't think he cheated. I don't think it is. I feel like that's the whole situation. There was nothing enhancing his performance whatsoever. Spin rates were the same. Velocity was the same. Drop was the same. And, you know, you're in LA, you're sweating. I guess, but my whole situation with rosin and sweat is rosin is legal. So I don't understand. Maybe they said there was too much on his glove or maybe there was just too much going on on his hands. It was just way too sticky. There was some speculation as well with the pitch com where he had a piece of tape on his on his hand as well. Um, And they're talking about like the the substance from the tape or whatever, because it wasn't staying on. That may have been the sticky substance that he had or something. But it was not enhancing his performance whatsoever. So I don't understand why it was basically pointed out completely by Dave Roberts. But Dave Roberts, once again, is not a good manager whatsoever. I mean, he's we, we've seen him just against the Mets alone. We have seen him just completely forget the rules. Forget the rules as a major league manager. I don't understand how this happened. Maybe it was just the... The checkups, but we were seeing a little bit too much of Dave Roberts being involved in this, which was kind of weird. Knowing the the Dodgers having this deep analytics department, there would be some speculation from them seeing spin rates going up or velocity going up, but it wasn't. So it may have just been a substance that was preferred as sticky, and that was where they kind of tossed it out, I guess. But it it wasn't enhancing the performance. I'm not saying it was right, but it wasn't it wasn't advancing the performance whatsoever. I, I really hope again it's a one-off thing because if it happens again, I, I think there's just going to be an extra eye 
on Max Scherzer. Yeah. I think from everywhere that you know, I feel like once you get caught with this kind of thing or suspended for this kind of thing once, everyone's going to put extra attention towards you and maybe his checkups and things like that with the between innings. Yeah, I'm currently I mean, I'm currently able to go with Max's reputation for a little bit of, you know, how he's not using anything extra, but if we have another problem like this again, that's when you're like, okay, well, this is my $43 million ace and you know, if he if we can't depend on him to, you know, do anything cuz remember before this start that happened, he had yeah, an injury. Yeah. An injury like he was he was set back. So, you know, if there's going to be this many obstacles, this is going to be a problem and you know, it, it's not going to go away. You're still going to have that concern cuz he's 38 years old whether it is injuries or whatever it is, but I mean, I'm you know, hopefully that, you know, he gets a handle on it because then I'm going to start to get a little bit disappointed if it happens again. But I think it was blown a little bit too out of proportion. I don't think uh, Phil Cuzzy uh, did the right thing here. But, you know, if he deemed it too sticky, he deemed it too sticky. And that's pretty much it. Um, and it's kind of weird to see that the only guys to be ejected since this substance ban have all been ejected by Phil Cuzzy. And that's mm. that's a very weird thing to talk about i mean yeah because that's the thing is that it becomes a very subjective thing and you don't have like actual like a measure like oh you know it this many whatever like actual number to it it's just like phil cozzy thing so then i mean what are we doing here it just becomes and not to mention a, Ma max 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 basically claimed he said i did everything that they wanted me to do i washed my hands i did this i switched a glove or whatever it was and he still got ejected so I I'm not ready to point the fingers towards Max. I'm not I'm not really pissed off at him yet. But if this happens again, I mean that's going to yeah. be just another situation where you know maybe we're in trouble. Yeah, a one time. Pass. And speaking of uh, being in trouble with the Max Scherzer suspension, the Mets veteran rotation has taken just another hit. Basically, a drinking game at this point. Justin Verlander, Jose Quintana, Carlos Carrasco, all on the injured list. The inconsistencies have forced the Mets to go deep into their depth just three weeks into the regular season. On this West Coast trip, the Mets have plugged in some spot starts from prospect Jose Budo with and also a masterful out from Joey Lucchese shoving seven scoreless innings against the Giants. Tyler McGill has really stepped up so far along with some 50-50 production from Kodai Senga, some good starts, some bad starts. The active weakest link has been David Peterson who has surrendered 21 earned runs in 25.2 innings pitched so far this season. Among the seven arms that have made a start so far this year, the Mets starters are ranked 27th in the MLB in Fangraph's wins above replacement with a staff earn run average of 4.63. Right now, from what we're looking at it, it's McGill, Sanga, Lucchese, and Peterson. And we're obviously missing a spot right now, which who knows if it's gonna be a bullpen game, I hope Dylan Bundy doesn't come here on short rest. Definitely a bit of concern from Peterson. The long ball has really been killing him. I mean, just leaving some pitches right on the plate, uh, some hanging pitches that have been getting crushed. And you can't – it's just very tough to win when David Peterson's giving up home runs and the Mets are hitting home runs on the flip side. And we know that with his walk problem, those are not solo home runs. They're two-run homers. They're three-run homers. And it just really puts the Mets out of the game quick and early. I will give Peterson the benefit of the doubt here. His control has actually been fairly better com as to compare to, you know, compared to a lot of thing. But his command is even worse. He just never has those two together. Well, here's the thing is that the game against the Dodgers where he's serving up home run after home run, no walks. But I'll tell you what, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather David Pearson five walks, two runs than, you know, four home runs and no walks. I mean, that's the way I look at it. I mean, I never should throw a strike to Freddie Freeman if I'm in a New York Mets uniform. <laughs> Hell no, because that's an automatic extra base hit every time. So that was just dumb. I, I would have walked him automatically. That, that's just me. So uh, that's the way I feel is that I guess, I mean, you, it's so much like can't use the excuse. Oh, he's still young. He's trying to figure it out. And then I'm thinking, like, well, what can the role be for him? David Pearson has reverse splits right now, if I'm not mistaken. He's doing worse against lefties, and he's giving up home runs to lefties. So if this rotation ever does get healthy, you can't make him a lefty reliever. Again, maybe a long man, but if he's pitching like this, he should just be in the minor leagues or traded. 
but they're just they have so little depth right now he has to be in the starting rotation so uh, he's the guy that i'm really down on Sanga, he's been okay. You know what I mean? Like, he's keeping the Mets in ball games. He's giving you his five innings, six innings. It seems like two walks an outing. But as long as he's keeping it manageable and not getting hurt, which, again, like, we just have to have the bar really low and the expectations really low because of all the other crap that's happened with everybody else, that I'm okay with that for Kodai Sanga as a mid-rotation guy. But the guy that really deserves his flowers and really deserves his praise, I don't want to overreact, but I kind of have to. Joey Lucchese. I mean, that was oh, yeah. freaking awesome. Oh, yeah. I loved Absolutely. it. I, I really, Amazing. really loved it. There were a lot of things I liked about it. So here we go. First of all, we talked about Joey Lucchese coming off the Tommy John surgery, was eligible to pitch at the end of the season last year in September. He was finally healthy. And we were like, you know what? This team could use another lefty arm. This team could use another arm in general. They should call him up. And they never did. And we said, well, what's going on here? Do the Mets not like Joey Lucchese? Is there something with the he's not an Epler guy? We talked about things like that. But you know what? It got to the point this year, so early in the year, they have no other options. So here comes Joey Lucchese. And oh, my goodness, what a start. Because here's a guy who got past the fifth inning. And guess what? He didn't get tired like Carrasco. He got even better. That was oh, yeah. my favorite thing is that Joey Lucchese got better as the game went along. And it's like we've talked about so many times with this older rotation. you got to go with the young guys, the guys who have more potential, the guys who have more upside. I saw more from Joey Lucchese in this one start than I've seen from the end of Carlos Carrasco last year and the beginning of Carlos Carrasco this year. I saw more than that one start from Lucchese because he was actually able to put hitters away, getting strikeouts, something that Carrasco has not been able to do, not giving up home runs, and he got into the seventh inning through over 90 pitches in his first start coming off of Tommy John surgery and being out almost two years. So, I mean, he just did so many things well in a game where the Mets really needed because we talked about Max Scherzer, the three innings, no days off on this West Coast swing. You've had all these other guys get hurt. You need somebody to step up and actually go deep into the game. How about Joey Lucchese being the guy who's gone the deepest into the game than any New York Mets starting pitcher this season? So, I mean, he just did so many good things in one night. And I think that just with how little faith I have in Carrasco and some of the other arms, I'm willing to give him another start. Even if Carrasco was healthy, I'd say Joey Lucchese, do it again. He was using the fastball. He's going up in the zone. He's using the churve to put hairs away. So he's going up. He's going down. You know, I mean, he was just throwing the outside corner, inside corner, righties, lefties. I mean, and what was so interesting was that he's chilling there, you know, 90, 91. But then in that seventh inning, he dialed it up to 93 and 92. He overthrew. Those pitches were way off. But he was showing that, like, he still had just that little thing left in the tank and was emptying it out. So, I loved what I saw, and I think we need to see more of him. Let's see what he's got. You know what I mean? You, you got to at least see what's going on there. If he gets bombed, he gets bombed. But I think because of that start, he is so worthy of getting a couple more cracks at it because, I mean, that that was big. I mean, I, my expectations were like, I don't know what's going to happen, and he really uh, blew me out the water. Granted, I will acknowledge it, that Giants lineup is not good. I mean, this team is not very good. They got a really bad record. Uh, it's a bunch of former Mets and uh, a bunch of old guys and just some not all that great players. But uh, regardless, I still really love what I saw from Luke Casey. They needed it because, like we said, we've seen a lot of bad things for the rest of this rotation. One of my favorite things I've been doing so far this season has been uh, using the Bill James game score for starting pitchers. And uh, Joey Lucchese has the best. Highs F4 of the pitchers or something like that? I think I saw no, it's it's basically just scoring a starting pitcher. So basically they do get like for innings pitched for how many outs that they get. There's basically like, you know, hits, earn runs, and it's all just basically like in a scoring rate. And Joey Lucchese has the highest out of any starting he has 80. And that's the that's the highest of of and it goes up to, you know, 100 or, or whatever. The highest, I believe, is obviously the Kerry Wood uh, 20 strikeout game. That's like the highest ever. It's like 112, something like that. So, yeah, that was the best uh, outing. And then right after that was Tyler McGill with his uh, six scoreless innings. And uh, the worst being, and, and David Peterson yesterday, actually, he had the fourth worst outing of any Mets starting pitching. So that's fantastic. Um, but 
Now, I don't, I don't know how long of this is going to sustain for Lucchese. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're throwing 89 to 91 miles an hour fastballs, I don't see how it is. But he has a funky motion. He can finesse you. Why not? If you could get another quality five to six innings from him, it would be great. I don't see him shutting down uh, the Braves lineup if he's lined up against them, but at this point, I'm. I mean, it was it was definitely a start that they needed, and they 100% just like it was a fingers crossed. Let's just put them into the fire, whatever. And even though that it was against a Giants team that does strike out a lot, and you know they have, you know, a lack of depth in their lineup. I mean, this was length that they needed to preserve that bullpen, and the bullpen was massively overworked throughout this entire West Coast trip. The state of this rotation is it has to get healthy, and it's really hard to think that that's actually going to happen because Justin Verlander, it looks like he's going to go for a rehab start. So, you know, he's probably going to miss, you know, totaling up the days. He's probably going to miss in, you know, a month and a week already of the season. This was our guy who we replaced, uh, you know, the greatest pitcher that I've ever seen in our rotation. He has not thrown a pitch for us yet. Max Scherzer coming in and out with some injury bugs and now a suspension. I mean, Kodai Senga, you know, he's been in and out or whatever, but you can't rely on him to be the greatest pitcher of all time coming out of Japan. You know, there's still some adjustments that he needs to be making. And then, you know, Carlos Grasco has just been a complete mess. David Peterson, what a shock. No one saw that coming. And then Tyler McGill, he's looked good, but Another one where I don't know how long that is going to last because there is a few concerns that I have, but you know, currently it's it's pretty much just stringing whatever is together, stringing whatever you can together, and you know, putting it in that position to win, and that's pretty much all we're looking at. And it's a shame because I mean, it has to be one of the highest paid rotations, and yeah. I think that's what's really frustrating is that when you have this high a payroll, and especially it comes from those two old guys at the top. When you're the richest owner in baseball and you're spending a lot of your money here and it's one of the worst in the league, it's like, okay, well, how are we um, allocating our resources? How are we utilizing this big payroll? And it's like, maybe we should invest it in, oh, I don't know, offense? I mean, if these guys are going to be hurt and not pitching well anyway, I mean, how about I get some power back from here instead? Maybe we could invest in guys who aren't three years away from an AARP membership. Ooh, like, that's a possibility. Yeah. You could do that. Maybe just go with, like, some younger guys who are durable, multiple durable arms for the back end of the rotation. That's possible. Wow. That, that's just out of nowhere. Um, you know, maybe some rotation depth. That would be nice as well. I'm I'm scared. I really am scared because a few of the depth pieces as well that could start. Eliezer Hernandez is out, right? He's out. <sighs> Already, he's on the he's on the IL. Dylan Bundy doesn't look good at all. He's striking out a lot of guys, but he's also giving up a lot of dick shots. Please. The next one on the list is probably Humberto Mejia. Oh dear. Yeah, like I mean, it's it's young, but it's not great quality. They can't call Bruno back up, right? Because he has to be down for a certain amount of days. I think they're gonna start Yakabonis for a three inning beginning because he he has experience as a starter. But I don't think he's fully stretched out as one. I think if they could get three innings from him, get three innings from somebody else, and three innings from you know he's whatever the it is. On the forty but, man. Other than that, um, there's there's a lot of injured pitchers on the forty man. None of these other guys are starting pitchers. So unless is Seth Elijah a starting pitcher, he's a reliever too. No, he one hundred percent isn't, and he's not. He's barely a reliever, to be honest. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the only other guy that's on here that we haven't really seen that's not hurt. And, and the last thing that I want to bring up here in the, this whole topic is just shut it down with Carlos Carrasco. I think oh, I yeah. think it's just time to oh, shut it down. Yeah. The fact that we saw, like, this, this story of him getting an injection, like, you're really injecting a 36-year-old arm. Like, just give it up. Please give it up. Like, I, I, I understand. We like the veterans. He's proven he's been good. But at this point in his career, he's just not what he, he used to be. And I understand that their need for starting pitching and, you know, which they probably could have solved in the fucking offseason. But one thing that we need to know is that Jacob deGrom's not dependable and never healthy. And uh, he was he was the guy we had to let go. It's very easy to replace an ace. It's very, very easy. So since being called up, the Mets' top two prospects have been pretty much getting 
limited playing time. So far, Beatty is four for 17 with a walk. Francisco Alvarez is three for 23 with an RBI. The Mets' top catching prospect and third base prospect have yet to start a game together in back-to-back -back games since Beatty was promoted last week. What, it, what has to be said about how much they are stunting the development of Alvarez and Beatty by basically just using them as platoon players. And the thing that's most frustrating is who they're using them as platoon players for. Like, what the hell is so great about Tomas Nito and Luis Guillorme? I mean, seriously, why? And, and Escobar too. Like, why do those guys have anything to do with the development of Beatty and Alvarez? Like, why are they mitigated to part-time players? Again, if they're going to be part-time players, why are they even here at all? I mean, we've said it literally every week. I, I don't want us to repeat ourselves, but I just don't get why they don't get the consistent playing time, especially Beatty. It's like, come on now. Uh, this guy, even he's done more, like we said with Carrasco, he's done more in a limited amount of time than Escobar did all year. I mean, it's, it's plain and simple. I mean, Escobar's had a couple home runs this homestand. I know, he's had this um, West Coast trip. But again, when the Mets are up by a million, that's when he's hitting them. Um, so as far as Beatty, at least he's getting some line drives and RBI hits, better exit velo. I mean, that's the things I'm looking at. I'm just looking for productive ABs. That's all I ask for. Uh, as far as Alvarez, there's still – not productive ABs, there's still a lot of work to be done. But again, he has to get the full-time development, whether it's here or the minors. This kind of playing every now and then for freaking Tomas Nito, is, Alvarez is never going to be the guy you want to be. So stop with the call-up, send-down, and the part-time. Like we've said before, make a decision and stick to it. I mean, you really have got to just be, be very firm with it and be like, this is what it is, and that's it. I mean, you can't do this kind of half-assery because you're getting half the development. So it's really just very foolish the way they definitely put up the frustration of and, and I feel like, you know, Buck gets a lot of, you know, pat on the backs and a lot of a lot of passes for a lot. And I see that a lot with the fan base of, you know, oh, well, Beatty and Alvarez have not been the savior yet because you're not playing them. And listen, I understand that Buck has gotten a lot of respect throughout the game of baseball. He's a baseball for lifer. But doing stuff like this. This is the type of stuff that gets a manager fired. I'm not going to lie. This is the type of stuff that gets a big league manager fired. Not playing the kids. Well, they extended Tomas Nito. So, I mean, obviously he has to be a big part of this team. Well, I mean, That's he was going to be here for two years Alvarez. either way. But right in the high hand of guys who actually have been producing. Alvarez has played better defense than Tomas Nito. So the, the, the defense of argument out the window which is why he was supposed to be called up anyway because of the defense that's what i mean that's what i mean it's just like they're not even giving them a chance to prove that they're better and even when they are giving them the chance they're still proving that they are better Beatty has been great in terms of being overmatched from major league pitching or undermatched of major league pitching he looks great out there he definitely does some strikeouts are going to happen they struggle it's going to happen every single top prospect comes up here and they struggle. They show their promise and they struggle. It happens. As for Alvarez, it's a different situation. One, he's 21 years old as compared to all the other top prospects who come up at 23, 24. He also needs to learn the catcher position. It's a very fragile position that you're dealing with. I think that Alvarez should just be in AAA right now at this point. But you don't have Omar Narvaez right now. He's on the injured list. I think I don't even think anybody's mentioned his name in weeks at this point. Nobody even, nobody even realized that this guy is still on the team, to be honest, because there's been so much obsession with Alvarez. I would have taken just calling up Michael Perez if you're going to do this with him. Because even though Michael Perez is not good, Alvarez needs to be playing every day. Beatty needs to be playing every day. Fans should not have to put in prayer circles and say, oh, I hope Beatty and Alvarez are in the, in the lineup today. This should be a given. They should be every day of the tradition of, you know, how you always see the Mets lineup card notification on your phone. Nimmo's always leading off. That's what we should see guaranteed. Beatty and Alvarez in there. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. Another catching prospect right now that you can compare Francisco Alvarez to, uh, Gabri uh, Gabriel Moreno or whatever. I, I don't, Moreno, whatever. He has over 100 plate appearances already this year. And they traded one of their catchers so he could actually play. Yeah, exactly. They traded one of his catchers, right? So I'm not saying, again, insert future franchise catcher right here, 
but give them the chance to play. You have to let them learn through the mistakes. You have to let them play through it. I need to see 100 to 150 plate appearances before you make an actual judgment on these prospects. You got to give it time. And consistent plate appearances as well. Not, yeah, that's not just, what I know, mean. It's one, just if, it's one, if it's 150 you know, bad ones or just random ones, You'll never get to see a true development. Really frustrates me more with Alvarez and Beatty. He's striking out a lot. He's swinging a lot. That's because he doesn't have any chances to swing at all. They're not giving him. He gets he gets three plate appearances every three games. Like it's just ridiculous how they are doing this. If they are here, they need to be playing every day. There is no obstacle for them. And like I like said, tons of times, Eduardo Escobar is not that important. Important compared to the development of your top third base prospect. And it is absolutely ridiculous how they are dealing with this right now. And hopefully they become everyday players, but I don't know how they're going to prove that they can be an everyday player with such little playing time that they are getting. This is absolutely ridiculous how they are treating it. And if it continues to go, you're going to stunt their development and it's going to be looking even worse worse they should not be used as platoon players they are every day players and if they're going to play every day it's either they play every day here or they play every day in triple a this is ridiculous it's stupid if you want to go veteran heavy go veteran heavy but don't string around along these young guys and just having them sit on the bench for no reason so now speaking of prospects there is one story that has developed a lot this year so far, that being Ronnie Mauricio, the 22 year old shortstop prospect, has been destroying AAA baseball with an OPS over 1,000, posting a 138 WRC plus with six homers and 13 extra base hits. This week, Syracuse decided to test positional flexibility for the first time, starting Mauricio at second base. Mets GM Billy Epler said he thinks now is the right time because they didn't want to throw too much at Mauricio too soon. He was moving up to the level of AAA and was going to be pitched a lot differently, and they wanted him to focus on the offensive side while not having him learn a new position. Buck Showalter said that the Mets minor league infield coordinator, Miguel Cairo, believes that Mauricio is capable of playing shortstop, second base, third base, first base, and the corner outfield. The Mets' sixth overall prospect seems to be knocking on the major league door sooner rather than later. I think the main question here is, you know, them moving him to, third, to second base. Uh, there was some speculation, and they were talking about how having him at shortstop they just see him as a trade piece and now they are putting him in different positions you know maybe they're trying to increase his trade value as far as i'm concerned right now i think that that's when you open the question once again of what is ronnie Murray's future is it does he have a new future is it is now mapped out with him playing very well in triple a and now trying different positions is it possible I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad to finally see him play a new position. I mean, that's what I've been saying. All, we've been all saying that all along is that he's got to play somewhere else if he's going to be a part of this team. But the thing is, if you put him on second base, well, what does that mean for Jeff McNeil? Because you also he's just traded. gave him a contract. Bye. You also Gone. just gave him a contract extension. So, I mean, what, are we going to move McNeil to left field now? I mean, how many left fielders are we going to have? We're moving everybody to left field. So, I'm still, again, like, it's still just so early. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens trade deadline season, if he's here, if he's in the minors, if he's traded. I mean, again, I, uh, like I've said before, the only way I'm trading Marusio is if this rotation continues to be old and bad, I need a young starting pitcher who's really, really good, household name, name brand, or a big-time name brand household. No, no, you know what I mean? Like, big-time bat, you know? Other than that, then I'll keep him. But – that's the only way I'm, I'm making moves. I got to get either a young controllable starting pitcher or a big time power bat that can actually make a big impact for this team. Because if I'm in win now mode, I can't be holding on to Vientos and Marusio and all these guys. And then, I mean, what, let, let's just say, like, if they call them Marusio, do you know they give him the same treatment that they're giving Beatty and Alvarez right now? It, it'd probably make it even worse for everybody. That's what I'm scared of. Yeah. You would have just another guy taking at bats from the other guys who need at bats. Because again, like, Lindor is playing every single day. McNeil is playing every single day. Alonzo, every single day. So where else are these guys going to go? I mean, obviously, Canna's got to play. And if Marte and Nimmo are healthy, they're going to play. And then you got Vogelback who needs to get out. And then you have Tommy Pham who also needs to go. So, uh, again, like, you know, 
we'll see what happens if they actually do some shifting of the roster, some shuffling of the deck, so to speak. But uh, I'm glad Ronnie's still playing well. I like what I saw in spring training. I really like the power, you know, that no doubt power. That's something that this team could really use. Um, but it might not be quite yet. He might not be. He's obviously not ready quite yet. So definitely something to keep a close eye on, though. It's exciting for sure. It's funny that you say that he's not quite ready yet because, to be honest, I believe that he is. He has been so good in Syracuse. He has looked fantastic. Like, he looks like a completely different player. Like, that's how good he is. We talk about him chasing a lot, the plate discipline. Amazing. Like, he's been, it's not even just, oh, it's improved. The rates are going down. This guy's in, like, top percentiles in, like, all chase rates and max exit velocity. His pitch recognition is just so much better. And that's what I really like about it. And, again, it can only get better because he's 22 years old. I'm not trading any of the prospects. Okay, so let's say, let's say, they're like, okay, fine. Percentiles are great. P pitch recognition is great. Call him up today. What is his role? What are you doing with him? If they're going to say that, he can play second base, right? Which game, I am play going like one to. Time so far. Yeah, true. If he looks good, you know, throughout three weeks. Big second baseman. Big second baseman. True. Um, what is it? Six foot. I mean, he's listed at six foot three. Looks six five. DJ Lemayhew's six four. I mean, is it possible that 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 you know you, you could have a taller second baseman? Maybe. But, I mean, he moves pretty well for a guy who is as tall as he is and as big as he is. Is it possible that maybe they move him to left field? Again, is it possible or that they move him? Left. I mean, yeah, sure. Well, people not? gave is... him Jordan Alvarez comparison, so why not? So Yeah, I mean, it's possible. Why not? Everybody's in left field. Yes, you could trade these guys for possible pieces. And, yes, they shouldn't be in AAA, rotting away in AAA when they've obviously outperformed the entire AAA league. I'm not trading any of them at this point because I just see at this, at this with this not lineup, this team, not even Vientos, because this team's so old. And who's going to okay. be here? Well, like fair. actually hitting. And again, I know we have some hitting prospects in the lower levels that could eventually make their, their mark mm -hmm. here. But, you know, these guys are on. They're short-term deals and they're little, you know, they're older veteran guys. None of these guys hit for like any sort of prolific power. Some of these guys, you know, in terms of Alvarez, Beatty, Vientos, and Mauricio, they all could. And I think that there's a possibility where they have all four of them up here and they see what they get from them. And then they address what they need to do at the trade deadline. I need them to just add some power to the lineup. And this would not be something that would be such an issue and... In terms of Alvarez and Beatty and their playing time, nobody would be as pissed off about their playing time at the major league level if you actually got a fucking bat at the in the offseason. Guys yeah. who actually could do it right now, and you could put them in the lineup every single day. But they chose not to do that. They chose to invest in their prospects and see how they develop this year, season. And that's why there is a lot of frustration, because we would like them to replace a lot of the dead weight. So I can't have them contradicting their own criteria every goddamn time. That's that's, oh, yeah. that's what I really yeah, want. Well, I mean, that's what I would say. What is the criteria? Because they always are just changing stuff around all the time. It seems like they have a standard for every single different player, and that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, especially which is how like imbalanced this roster could be without the young guys on the roster. So when do we see the Nimmo, Marte, Lindor, Alonzo, McNeil, Vientos, Marusio, Alvarez, Beatty lineup? What, what, what's the date on that? The ETA? Too late. I feel like that's just going to be a little too late, but we'll see what happens. I just, I, I can't, you can't have the lineup that you're putting out pretty much every other day. Now the coming out with Beatty and Alvarez, it just can't happen. It really just can't happen. And, and even though it's not like they're bad again, they're not bad hitters. They're not bad players. It's just the combination just doesn't work. Like it's just, they need, you need power in this game. And that's something that could possibly be supplied from these young guys, or maybe it gets addressed at the trade deadline, which we have not been seen and they haven't proven that they can do that so far. That's what's frustrating, you know? Like, I, I can't deal with that. It's like I said, you can't have Canna, Vogelback, and Guillaume all in the same lineup, which I think they all are tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Or at least two of the three are in there. Like, what are we doing? Fantastic. And they also batted three lefties in a row today. I also found that. Okay, no Canna today, but they're still Vogelback and Guillaume. But Beatty Alvarez batting back-to-back, -back, so that's... Yeah, fantastic. Bottom of, the, bottom of the lineup types of hitters, you know? 
Um, cause you know, if, if Beatty gets on and so does Alvarez, you know, you got Luis Guillermo to drive him in. So you're all good. Throughout the first month of the season, Brandon Nimmo has been one of the best players in all of baseball. The Mets center fielder is currently slashing 368, 479, 526 with a 183 WRC plus two homers, eight extra base hits in 95 plate appearances. In all of the major leagues, Nimmo now currently holds the highest wins above replacement at 1.6 six value now i don't really think he's going to be keeping up this mvp caliber play that he is right now but we all know nimmo has been able to give you consistency for consecutive years now give you those all-star caliber seasons like this and i think the real question is is this the year that he finally does get that recognition does he finally become an all-star which we all appreciate here i mean obviously it's just that's that's the type of recognition I think that at this point he does deserve because he's been fantastic so far, but we all know overall he's going to have a fantastic season overall. Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously, like all those numbers you listed doesn't show up, but still the highlight reel plays, it seems like almost on a nightly basis, whether oh, yeah. he's diving or jumping. I mean, you're seeing him rob some extra base hits and uh, you, you go to appreciate him when you see Tommy Pham out there who can't catch any, doesn't make any of those plays. So. I really get more of an appreciation for all the things. You also appreciate him when you also had to see Jordani Valdespin out there and Colin oh, Cowgill. Oh, 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 the great one. I mean, we've talked about it so many Absolutely, times. Absolutely, the legend. Uh, what I wanted to see from Brandon is more of this, you know, swinging the bats. The five-hit game, the back Scherzer game we got suspended. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you want to see out of a guy who you gave a lot of money to. Uh, whereas when the season first, first started, Nimble was pretty much walks exclusively. I mean, he had a great all base, but he drew a ton, a ton of walks. And that's fine enough for the leadoff hitter. But um, when you have a team who is walk, 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 like we've said before, somebody's got to swing the bat. So I, I do hope we see a, a bit more of an aggressive Brendan Nimmo, a new Brendan Nimmo. Um, in order for him to become an all-star, he's going to need these casual numbers. Right now, only two home runs. That's not going to get it done. But he does have the 368 batting average. That'll get you there. High on base percentage won't do it. It's got to be either the average or the home runs. That's the only way you could become an all-star and be recognized by the casual fan base. So uh, I hope he could do it. I mean, he hit a nice one out in San Francisco. Not, not an easy ballpark to do that in. So I, I like to see that. But uh, this is definitely what the Mets need from a guy who someone else has to step up. Because we've talked about Pete Alonso just being on another level, carrying the team. You need somebody else to really step up and be that, uh, I don't want to say sidekick, but another big-time contributor. Because with Lindor, it's been mixed results. Uh, McNeil has his singles. Marte's been in at the lineup with injuries. So it's nice to see Brandon Nimmo stepping up because we know all the other guys. Yikes. So it, it definitely a uh, much needed production from Brandon Nimmo. And you see the results with the Mets winning a lot of these games. This every single year, this guy gets better. He just gets better every single year. Let's not forget... When he was called up, this was called a fourth outfielder who is always injured, can't play center field. I mean, the list goes on and on. Why did you draft this guy in the first round? What the hell was Sandy thinking? Which we usually ask a lot, but <laughs> he has been fantastic so far. And this is a different level, which who knows if he does sustain this whatsoever. But I mean, he just continues to get better every single year. And that's just something that you really are happy to see right now. And Another thing, you know, and, you know, you can knock on wood if you're superstitious, but he's just stayed healthy. He's been healthy. He's been in the lineup every single day. And even though guys could replace him as a possible leadoff hitter, because we've got tons of those here, I mean, nobody does it like Nemo. Nobody does it like Nemo. Strikeouts are at a career low right now. He's at a career low rate. He's at a career high, high in walk rate. I mean, he's been Brandon Nemo and he's been Jeff McNeil com combined. Almost makes that second baseman even more obsolete than he actually is. Isn't that crazy? But other than that, I mean, he, at this point, I think it's time where he does get that recognition. And I think he really should. I don't think he's going to be doing it at this level. And, you know, there is going to be that competition, but it's about time that he actually does get the recognition that he deserves as an all-star caliber player. Because when he is healthy, he is, in my opinion, he's our best hitter like overall, as our best hitter. Pete Alonso's our best power bat. He's our biggest bat, our big bopper. But overall, as an overall hitter, Brandon Nimmo is our best hitter. And you just that's literally what you're looking at right now. And, you know, you're also starting to see him steal some bases too, which is something that's been one of your main gripes with him 
uh, recently. Um, that, that he has now tied his what is it, his third career high. He's got three. Yeah, bigger bases. Might as well go, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I, mean, let's I, I don't pick know. Off. I mean, this is what I want to see. I mean, make the money worth it. And and he's been over what he's been worth so far. I mean, that that's pretty much the... Oh. He's on pace right now, and, and obviously he's not going to reach it because, you know, he'll always have that injury concern, whatever. On pace right now, near 12-win season. I mean, that's how really good he's been so far in the month of April. Is he going to do it? No. But, I mean, he has really just been a very valuable piece to this team, and I really do hope that he does get that recognition because for those who don't watch the Mets religiously, you know, Brandon Nimmo gets $162 million. They're like, oh, What's this? I mean, you know, does he actually deserve that? But, you know, he reaches that little bit higher of that level. I mean, it's it's definitely it's definitely impressive what he's been able to do. Mets fans know how good this guy is. And I'm just I'm also just so glad that we brought him back because again, like we've said before, the center field options were not great in free agency or on the trade market. Stay healthy. I mean, that's what it comes down to because we know that oh, yeah. he can do a lot of different things, it's just a matter of staying on the field. That's all we ask. That brings us to everybody's favorite segment, studs and duds. One player who has really performed fairly well and one player who has not played fairly well. And we want to completely destroy and drag through the fire. I guess we'll start with studs. What do you got? I got Jeffrey McNeil. Uh, I'm glad to see him have a, a really good West Coast trip, a very good week. We were starting to get a little worried about him because we were seeing some of the uh, 2020 McNeil where he was running out of the batter's box. He's swinging, five pitches off, and he's running down the first base line. A lot of temper tantrums, slamming the helmet. You know, we, we saw like a lot of that 2020 McNeil. And I get worried that if he gets off to a slow start, he's one of those guys who could get in his head and it could spiral and things could continue going bad. But he seemed to found himself a little bit in this West Coast trip. A lot of, you know, infield singles, weak contact singles, but. Batting average trying to creep up. And once Jeff is smiling and not screaming and throwing the helmet, uh, you'll see the McNeil much more like last year than the 2021. So uh, I hope he can keep it going and, and just get close to the player I know he's capable of. So he finally had a good week, so I got to give him his credit. His hits come in bunches, and this has definitely been one of those bunches stretches. I got Joey Lucchese because I just got to give him his flowers here. I mean, this was a situation where we hoped that we could get four or five innings out of this guy he has been out of the league for about two years recovering from tommy john surgery i mean from somebody who's seen him in the minor leagues this year he didn't look that sharp and overall it just doesn't seem like he had like that full-on you know gap of things that he could use to his advantage and you now he just completely shut us up here against a giants lineup that is not really as competitive but it was a start that we really needed, and I really think that he deserves the flowers because he gave us length, something that we have not seen at all this season from any starting pitcher whatsoever. Let's talk about who sucks. Here's a bit of a surprise, one you probably wouldn't have had in your bingo card, but Francisco Lindor. I've been a little disappointed this week. I, I think uh, a little too many strikeouts. And so far this season, overall, we've seen a lot of struggles from the left side. He's been, he's been good from the right side. But batting left-handed, uh, there's been that overswing. Uh, just not all, all too much production from him, especially in that number three spot. Very important. And we know Brandon Nimmo had the massive week, but it's like how many times did Lindor actually bring Nimmo home? How many times did he reward uh, Nimmo's great performance? So I definitely want to see more to him being the guy supposed to be our leader in the lineup. Uh, the guy's getting paid the most overall total contract. I do need a little more than this. Uh, you know, these one hits, a single here and there. I need a little more, especially on the left side. I need him to be giving me that power because we talked about he's supposed to be that second power um, option to Alonzo, and he has not been that guy, uh, especially this week in um, California. So I, I do want to see him get it going because uh, we talked about the first year he had that you know 230 average, then last year got to 270, 280. Right now he's showing that 220. That's something that could change in a week because it's still so early in the season. But uh, I do want him to – I know he's been drawing his walks a little bit, but again, 337 OBP. I need a little more than that for his contract. I will counteract with that with he's striking out more. Good. That means he's trying to hit more homers. That's 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 what he's trying to do. He's sacrificing contact. But he's not but he's power. not hitting the homers though. I mean, listen, well, if, I, he's, I'm, if he's not chasing, that's 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 well, the main of thing. Course. He but can't I'm be saying, chasing. I'm, I'm, I agree yeah. with you. If he strikes out more, but you give me more homers, I'll live with that trade off. But if you're giving me neither, I'm like, well, what are we doing? And he's been good from the right side. He, he's he's hitting line drives. Not, you know, having as much bad swings, but for some reason, for the left side, even the last where he gets more reps in, 
haven't really seen it. I mean, I've talked about this era of baseball now of where strikeouts have become a lot more subjective. It's kind of just more talking about chases and whiffs. And if somebody doesn't whiff and doesn't chase, but they, you know, they they sacrifice contact for more power, that's basically just how they kind of succeed. Um, a good example of this is actually Max Muncy, someone who doesn't chase, someone who doesn't whiff. And when he sees a pitch that he likes, he hits a dong. Absolutely. He's leading the league in home runs right now. So, I mean, that that's just the type of prototype hitter that just definitely succeeds. And it's, but he had a it's terrible year last year. Absolutely he did. terrible. And now he, he's off to an amazing start. Exactly. There's there's just some combinations that just really click. When they're hot, they're hot. David Peterson, you thought that you could run away from me, did ya? <laughs> Two crappy back-to-back -back starts. What is that? The third worst or whatever. Um, I will give him credit. Again, like I said, he's been decent with the control, but then... The command's dog shit. Um, pairing those two together, that's just pretty much how it is. And uh, when you walk guys with your controls off, then your command will stu suffer as well. They're basically two sides of a seesaw that just go back and forth, and it's time to find that balance. I'm getting real tired of this guy. I've been tired of him. I understand that he's expected to be one of these back-end five starters, but I'd say it all the goddamn time. He's 27 years old. He was a first round pick. He came with a lot of expectation and he has not lived up to it. One point you got to call a spade a spade, but a little bit too e it's a little too early. It's only April. I'm sure he's going to have another eight inning stretch where he does very well and he wins back the fan base. And uh, we call him Sandy Koufax once again. All the injury problems and all the inconsistent and all the suspensions now. Like we said earlier, we have a four man rotation. And one of them has been extremely unreliable being David Peterson. So I know a lot of people talking about DFAing him. That's not going to be a possibility because one, he has minor league options. And uh, also we would have a three man rotation for the next 10 days. So that's not going to happen as much as he pisses me off. There's not really much of a logic behind that. So to the fans saying that it's not going to happen. So that brings us to the questions that you guys sent to us. If you guys want to send us a question, click the link in the description, fill out your name and your Mets related question, and it could be featured on the next episode of the Mets Weekly Podcast. This question that we have today is from Cohen of Queens. He says, one active ex-Met that you would bring back slash somebody who you think the Mets gave up on too soon. That's actually really interesting because there's a lot of former Mets out there doing their thing. I think there's an obvious one that I'm probably I would probably go with, but I'll I'll try to store it in the back in the back room. Um but obviously I'll I'll put out Jacob deGrom, obviously I would have kept him, but that's just that's such a cop out. I mean Wheeler's out there. Would have liked to kept Wheeler. That's um, my top guy. My second guy off the top of my head is actually the guy that we've seen Wilmer Flores. He had a home run um yesterday, but listen, Mets need a guy who can hit lefties. Wilmer Flores could still do that. Good batting average, good OPS. He was good with the Mets. Clutch? I mean, you can't teach clutch. I mean, Will Flores was he really, off. though? Like, let's be real. He was won he really? Game. Listen, Mets are tied or losing. Wilmer Flores steps up the plate. Boom, Mets win. Clutch. And then obviously Trevor Williams, like we talked about. Maybe another. Yeah, guy. Trevor Williams is another one. You can obviously talk about him. I'm not going to go down the Justin Turner route. I really am not going to. I don't think it would have worked whatsoever. Well, yeah, I mean, because like he was still going to have the crappy Mets coaching. They weren't going to fix his swing. So I'd say Conforto, but they're just going to turn him into a spray hitter again. So what's the fucking point if they were to bring him back at the deadline or whatever? Yeah, that, that's that's actually a real it is a really good question. Considering what the rotation looks like right now, I probably would be willing to lose an arm or, or a leg to get uh, Zach Wheeler back. Even though he's had some of his struggles this season so far, he's been he on the mound. He makes starts. And, and he he's makes starts, and yeah. Even in, that even happened when he was a Met. Wheeler would have his inning where he'd give up his four runs in the third, but he still gave you five to six things. He didn't like let it just knock him out of the ballgame. So that's something that they desperately need. brings us to the rapid fire stories. Justin Verlander has now been moved to a five day rehab schedule, which started with him throwing live BP yesterday. Verlander will make his rehab start on Friday, which lines him up to make his Mets debut 
in the first week of May. After being placed on the 15-day injured list last week due to elbow inflammation, Carlos Carrasco's MRI revealed a small bone chip in his right elbow. The 36-year-old pitcher received an ejection in his elbow, and the hope is that he can resume throwing in two weeks. Otherwise, he could be facing surgery. The Mets have recalled Jeff Brigham from AAA Syracuse. The Mets acquired Brigham from Miami along with Eliezer Hernandez in the offseason, and he has already recorded three clean outings with the Major League team. Dennis Santana has cleared waivers and has been outrighted to AAA Syracuse. The 28-year-old right-hander was designated for assignment last week by the Mets to make room for Jimmy Yacobonis. The Mets have activated Tommy Hunter from the injured list. The corresponding move ended up being the Mets optioning Denny Reyes, who has pitched seven scoreless innings so far this season out of the Mets bullpen. The Mets have optioned John Curtis to AAA Syracuse as the corresponding move for Joey Lucchese. Curtis has made nine appearances for the Mets this season. And he has surrendered five earned runs in 10.1 innings pitched. Steven Nagosik began his rehab assignment in AAA Syracuse after being placed on the injured list with a bone bruise in his right elbow. Nagosik is eligible to be activated on April 30th and is out of minor league options. Parting words for episode 16. Yeah, I mean, my, my thing is I just hope that they could magically find someone who's halfway decent to pitch on Tuesday. I, I just don't think the bullpen game is the way to go. I think it's just too early in the season to be doing something like that and that they don't have the bullpen to do it. I think that, you know, just tiring out your bullpen right away to start off your week because they have the day off on Monday. So, I mean, to just start off like your very first day back with a done bullpen, I just don't think that's a good recipe for the games going forward. I just don't think that sacrificing uh, your bullpen for that one game is worth all the way it's going to hurt you going forward, possibly. So I, I wish they would actually get an arm in here. Uh, where it's going to come from, I don't know. I'll be honest. I wish I had that solution on that. I haven't got really a chance to look into it. But I think that what I would say is that we knew that this was very realistic possibility in the offseason. They should have had somebody. And what stands out to me the most, my main takeaway, we talked about it. Trade Carlos Carrasco for multiple young arms with high upside that were healthy because you would have multiple arms, not just one old arm that was on its way out. You could have had two guys, maybe one of them sticks, maybe one of them doesn't, but at least they're both healthy arms that you could have used. I think that would have been a perfect move for this team. They could have used that $10 million for maybe another power bat or something like that for the bench uh, that they would have lost getting rid of Carrasco's contract. So that's my main take. Yeah, in terms of the starting rotation, it just really shows how much they are missing Trevor Williams. I think that that's something from the back end of the rotation. It's it's definitely something of concern, even though you do have some guys who could replace that role. Trevor Williams did a fantastic job doing it, and they probably should have brought him back. But other than that, I mean, Tyler McGill is on the mound. There's still one more game of this 10-game road trip out west. I want them to go back home. I'm, I'm tired of this West Coast trip, even though they have played well. Uh, I, I just want to see City Field again. That's pretty much it. And, you know, we're in decent shape for the amount of bullets that the Mets have had to walk through so far. But hopefully May is better. That's what I'm hoping. It's better than April. And we just keep getting better and uh, also get hot at the right time, as per usual. Uh, let's not start hot and then end cold. That's all I ask. But other than that, we'll see you guys next week. Let's go Mets. Peace out.